You may be seated. My name is Adam Reed, and uh, with me is Corey Telsho and uh, AJ Perea on the panel. And I want to thank you and, and welcome you to uh, Kyle Driver's Oral. Uh, he's been working really hard on this, and, and uh, it's something I'm sure you'll be able to take something away from this today. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what to expect real quick, uh, Kyle's going to be giving his speech that he's worked hard on. And then when he's done, he's going to join us over here at the table where we'll discuss the ideas, throw out some questions, and then uh, around 4.45, 4.40, uh, he'll get the opportunity to ask us some questions and kind of put the spotlight back on us. So uh, let me pray for us real quick, and then we'll begin. Dear God, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for Kyle, and I thank you for the uh, blood, sweat, and tears that he's poured into his time here at MCA. Uh, thank you for the lives that he's touched, uh, for the relationships that he's built, and uh, the education that he's uh, invested in. And I pray that you um, speak through him today, that uh, he's able to be confident and have a good time. And I pray that we all uh, encourage him and, and are able to take something away and uh, ultimately do all things for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Science and the existence of God are often considered to be the two extreme ends of the religious spectrum, with the word science often being hand in hand with the word atheism. This is mostly due to the majority of the scientific community utterly rejecting the possibility of the existence of a God, only relying on their own scientific theories to explain everything in existence. Now, is creation scientific? Is it truly any less scientific than a theory like the Big Bang? Books such as the God Delusion by Richard Dawkins and Godless by Dan Barker seem to think so. Books like these, and there's a lot of them, pummel away at the arguments for a creator and are championed as the answer by the scientific community alongside their other theories. But when a genuine in-depth look at all the facts for both sides of the argument is taken, one thing becomes clear, and that is that science does not disprove God. It points to his existence. The Big Bang Theory and the Steady State Theory are the two most commonly offered explanations for everything in our universe, or rather for the origins of the universe. The Steady State Theory says that the universe is eternal, without a beginning that necessitated a cause, thereby allowing intellectuals to never mention God as part of the equation. But recently, scientists have discovered uh, ripples in the space-time fabric of the universe that would highly support the idea of inflation, or the faster-than-the-speed-of-light expansion of our universe. This is more commonly known as the Big Bang. Due to this, steady-state theory has mostly been ruled out as legitimate, and it is the Big Bang theory that has taken its place as the prevailing, unchallenged theory among the scientific community. Now, the Big Bang theory is just a very in-depth explanation of the birth of our universe. You can go to any scientific website and read about it to your heart's content. You will spend about 20 to 30 minutes, depending on the depth with which the article describes the theory, reading through confusing scientific jargon before realizing that through all that mess, there's a massive hole in this theory. The most brilliant and prominent scientists today, with all our technology, all our resources, all our knowledge, can explain to you precisely what happened from a few moments after the Big Bang happened all the way up until today. For example, we can trace the motions of the planets all the way back to each and every one's inception due to their mathematical motion within the cosmos. As another example, we know exactly how stars form, what that star goes through during its life cycle, and how that star dies. But here's the hole in the theory. They don't know how any of it happened in the first place. They can't explain how any of this is in existence in the first place. It's not because they choose not to. No, we don't, we don't want the general population to know about that. We're not going to tell them. It's not because of that. It's because they can't. Fred Hoyle, the very man who coined the term Big Bang, was once quoted as saying, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. Super intellect in this case being a divine creator or God. 
Now, he viewed the Big Bang not as something that happened by random chance, but by specific interference from a higher power. The Big Bang theory in its current form simply doesn't make sense, and here's why. Here's an illustration of what it might, talk, what it might be like to talk to an atheistic scientist about the Big Bang theory. You would say, well, how did it happen? Can you explain this to me? And they would say, well, it was in an explosion that happened in a split second. Okay, that's cool. What caused the explosion? Well, atoms were, became so densely packed and so heated that they exploded. Also cool. Where did the atoms come from? Well, there are subatomic particles. Where did the subatomic particles come from? You kind of get what I'm getting at here? They always have something that they can relate back to as the cause, but the whole basis of the Big Bang Theory is that something was caused from nothing. But they never get down to the point where there is nothing. They, that's not because that they choose not to tell us, it's because they can't. So the Big Bang Theory in its current form simply, it, not only is it counterintuitive, it doesn't, it's not possible in its current form unless you include the possibility of a divine creator. That's the only way to explain it. Now, fine-tuning is often the phrase that scientists use when they reference the fundamental balance of the laws and physics of the universe. Now, fine-tuning as a phrase can be simplified simply to the universe has just the right conditions to sustain life. For example, Earth is positioned perfectly, the perfect temperature, positioned perfectly away from the sun, and if it was positioned any farther out, it would be too cold. And if it was positioned any farther in, it would be too hot. Although I think people in Texas would argue that it is too hot. <laughs> All jokes aside, perfect temperature. In fact, it's often referred to as the Goldilocks zone because it's just right. As another example, Earth's gravity. If Earth's gravity was just a little bit weaker, we would have catastrophic muscle deterioration due to not having to fight against gravity all the time. So we would be so weak and frail that it would, be, it would take a whole lot less to cause us either injury or death. An even worse situation would be presented if gravity was too strong. If you made it strong enough, nothing bigger than a bug could survive, and even that bug would have to have very strong legs to even hold itself up off the ground. Now, in Apologetics this year, we read Case for a Creator, a book by Lee Strobel. And in that book, Mr. Strobel interviewed the renowned Robin Collins, a scientist and theologian, specifically for Christianity, that provided a very interesting analogy in regards to fine-tuning. So I'm just going to give you a brief rundown of that analogy. So imagine that you are an astronaut and you have landed on Mars. You're the first humans to ever be on Mars. And as you're exploring, you come across this biosphere. Now, this is a biosphere right here. I think this one's in Montreal. But the basis of a biosphere is just that it's a controlled environment on the inside that's typically different than the outside. So for example, if you found a biosphere in a desert, you might find an environment like a rainforest or just in general different than the desert on the outside. So as you're coming upon this biosphere, you kind of you walk up to it and you see this control panel. And on it is a very, very, very complicated series of knobs and buttons, all of which are tuned to perfectly sustain life within that biosphere. Temperature's perfect, gravity's perfect, the gases are perfect, just the right conditions. So if you're coming upon this biosphere and you see that all of this is so perfectly tuned. And if you're the first humans to ever be on Mars, you would logically conclude that some other intelligent being had put that sphere there. You wouldn't say that a Martian volcano had simply spewed forth ash a million years ago, and from that ash over a period of millions of years, that biosphere had formed with those buttons perfectly tuned to sustain life. So in this analogy, assuming that an intelligent being had put that there, that's Christians saying that God 
cared about us. And he cared about us enough that he engineered the universe in a fashion that would help us to survive and get the best out of our lives. Assuming that a Martian volcano had spewed forth the ash millions of years ago, that scientists claiming that all of this is random. So as you can see, the likelihood of fine-tuning being random is very small. And it's so minuscule, it's almost funny to talk about it. So Darwinian evolution is the most commonly offered theory that scientists give in support of animals being alive, or rather, the most common one they offer that doesn't include God. Darwinian evolution defined is simply the theory that all species of organisms rise and develop through a series of natural selections that increase the abil individual's ability to survive, compete, and reproduce. So, in an explanation, Darwinian evolution says that the longer neck giraffe would have a greater chance of surviving than the shorter neck giraffe because the shorter one would run out of their food supply quicker. They can't reach the leaves that are higher up. So that shorter giraffe would die of starvation. The longer neck giraffe would survive, possibly mate with another longer neck giraffe. And from that, having a long neck becomes the standard for the giraffe species. In another example, you have some field mice. Some of them match the color of the ground. Some of them starkly contrast with the color of the ground. Now, when the hawk comes for food, the starkly contrasted mice are more likely to get captured and eaten because the hawk can see them easier. Thus, they die more often than the camouflaged mice. The camouflaged mice reproduce. And, there, and therefore, they become the standard. It becomes the standard for there to be mice that are the same color as the ground. So this theory in its current form, I mean, it's not that illogical. It's not that hard to believe, right? Only if you disregard about 200 years of paleontological data. You can't, but the problem is you can't just do that. You can't, you can't just say, I don't like this scientific discovery because it doesn't coincide with what I'm trying to tell people is reality. So then why did Darwinian evolutionists do this? The reason that they do it is because paleontologists and archaeologists have been able to construct a fossil record of all creatures that have ever existed. This is due to the layering of Earth's crust. Over time, as Earth grows older, the crust builds upon itself. So, and for example, an animal that died 200 years ago would be buried deeper down than an animal that had died 100 years ago. So from this fossil record, we have the term Cambrian explosion, which is just named for the Cambrian period in which it occurred. Before the Cambrian period, we can see so in the pre-Cambrian period, the only thing that is on the fossil record are things such as worms, sea sponges, and some crustaceans, modern representatives of which are something like a crab or a lobster. At the beginning of the Cambrian period, we simply see massive amounts of animals simply appear with no transitional fossils to speak of. So then, how did that happen? Darwinian evolutionists would have us believe that those animals evolved over millions of years from their ancestors. But the problem is these animals simply appear with no transitional fossils to speak of and massive differences in bone structure, size, and survival habits. So from this, we can conclude that Darwinian evolution in its current form is simply invalid because the main meat of the argument has been proven false by another scientific field. At this point, an atheistic scientist would use the very last weapon in his repertoire, claiming that we simply haven't discovered all the facts. One day we'll figure it out. We don't need God to explain anything. This argument on its own seems all right. I mean, after all, 
We are discovering new things every day, increasing our knowledge about the world around us. So then how do we counteract this argument? In apologetics, we discussed Pascal's wager. Blaise Pascal, a 17th century theologian from France, proposed a wager that went something like this. You have two options in your life. You can choose to believe that God exists, or you can choose to not believe that God exists. Assuming that you maintain this belief the rest of your life, when you die, there's two possible things that could happen for either option that you could have chosen. So, if you chose to believe in God, and you were wrong, God doesn't exist, nothing happens. You simply cease to exist. You didn't really lose anything on that investment. If God does exist and you were right, you get to experience eternal happiness. Now, if you chose not to believe in God and you were right, God doesn't exist. No harm, no foul. Again, you simply cease to exist. You didn't lose anything. If God does exist and you don't believe in God, you're going to burn forever. Now, this is just philosophy, right? This is just our own human reason. Science, or humans often forget to consult the most important being on matters like this, and that is God. So, for my interview, or rather, in preparation, in preparation for my thesis, I interviewed Billy Rays, the senior pastor of Sovereign Grace Church. And he gave his opinion on fine-tuning and things like that, and he said that it appears that God has intentionally designed the universe in a way that points back to himself. And not only that, he offered me a Bible verse in support of his theory. And that was Psalm 19, 1 through 4, which says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. Yet they have no words, and no sound is heard from them, but their voice goes out unto all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. So from the Bible we have seen that God did, in fact, intentionally manufacture the universe in a way that pointed to himself. And from philosophy, we have seen that there is no harm in just accepting that God exists, just having a little faith. So going back to the atheistic scientist and his we-don't-have-all-the-facts argument, yes, it is logical to assume that we will make new discoveries as time progresses and increase our knowledge about the world around us, but when we attempt to predict the future, it's really not that efficient. You can guess about the future, however, based on the facts of the present. And the facts of the present demonstrate to us that God is most likely behind the origins of the universe. So when you go back and you think about the atheistic scientist's argument, Yes, we most likely will make new discoveries. But will they demonstrate the lack of need for God? Most likely not. They will demonstrate the need for God to explain the origins of the universe. So, just as a kind of re... like a re-going over what we've already talked about, we have seen from the Big Bang that their logic is flawed. We have also seen from fine-tuning that the likelihood of there being a random explanation for that is very, very small. We have also seen from Darwinian evolution that it has been proven wrong by its own other scientific field. We have also seen in each of these three cases that God is the only other efficient way to explain any of this. But why is any of this important? Why do any of us care about this? Well, it is very important to know these things because these are the flagship arguments that an atheist will give in support of their lack of faith in a God. So when you have these tools, you can pull them out and you can say, okay, let's have a civil conversation about this. Let's talk about it. So it is very, very important to be able to have a civil conversation. 
and bring more to Christ through talking to them with their own vocabulary, something they can acknowledge and something they understand. With these tools, I pray that we will be able to bring more people to salvation and to Christ. Thank you. So, uh, good job. It's over with, uh, that part at least. Uh, so, you have a lot of people here uh, listening to uh, your thesis, and I assume your hope is that they learn something and they, they then go out and put it into practice. Um, how would you recommend your audience to put this thesis into practice? So, um, obviously it depends on the type of person that you are and the way that you converse with others. Um, so I can't really speak for them, but for me personally, what I would do if I was to encounter someone that I needed to either explain to them that what they were believing was not necessarily the case or that, you know, there's a better, there's a better option for you out there. You know, God's there for you. If I was to try to explain that to someone... I would definitely take the time to get to know them first and be on friendly terms with them just so that once you actually confront them about something like that it would be they would take it more of a friendly conversation rather than just a straight up attack on them as a person or them as uh just them as a human being uh so that's what I would do I I don't know uh, the best way for others, obviously, to go about that, just because, you know, everyone handles confrontation differently, and everyone uh, would have their own method uh, as far as talking about that with someone. Okay. Uh, I, I know you go to MCA, and so uh, obviously the crowd here is a little bit different than other areas. Uh, have you ever had an opportunity where you've had this? type of uh, discussion with someone who um, was on the other side of the fence of belief than, than you? I, I do know a, f a couple of people that don't necessarily, they either aren't confident in their faith necessarily and are kind of just checking out things just to see what they, th they think is best for them or uh, as far, just as far as that, but uh, in terms of pure atheists, in the sense of they just don't believe in any God, I have never encountered uh, someone like that. Just because Midland, for the most part, is a very uh, mostly Christian environment, I feel like. Uh, not necessarily in, the, in terms of the way they conduct themselves and they behave, but what they claim to be, it's mostly Christian, okay. I think. So uh, you kind of pointed out uh, how it, it would be uh, th this information is kind of important for us in order to share the gospel. Um, what role does logic and reason um, seem to play in, in sharing the gospel? So when you're quoting Bible verses to someone or scripture to someone, it may come off as almost as snobby if they're not if if they either don't believe in God or they aren't necessarily confident in it, like, oh, you really just pulled out scripture on me, I I don't really like that. But when you pull out something that's uh in terms like in terms of philosophy or in terms of logic, that's a universal language. And maybe not in the sense of the language that, and a language you're actually speaking, but a language that everyone can understand within their own language that they speak, if that makes any sense. So uh, logic and philosophy, I feel like, are a very big uh, influencer of that because we can see from history that entire nations have 
decided to follow a worldview, and some have been positive uh, in regards to capitalism, because that's a philosophy, and some have not ended so well, as we can see from Germany in World War II. So it's a, it plays a very big part. Okay, so uh, one of the things I think that I see uh, a lot when it comes to kind of the different sides of, of this uh, argument, I guess you could say, is you have on one side you have uh, the atheist kind of kind of that's discussed in this thesis of um, pretty staunch atheist saying no there is no God because of science and then you have the other side uh, on the extreme uh, uh, Christian side that says well read the Bible and, and it'll tell you everything you need to know and and, uh, and kind of really on both sides you see a lot of um, arguing back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what, what role do you think humility plays in science and what role do you think humility should, or should, I guess I should say, uh, what role do you think humility should play in science and what role do you think it should play in Christianity? Well, that's actually uh, a very good question because uh, when I was doing research on this, what I would often come across would be scientists that would finally conclude that God was the only explanation. And when they tried to come forward with that, what would happen was they would be shunned or kicked out. Like there was a, a college professor that tried to s start professing that it was God that was behind the origins of the world. And he got kicked out of the university that he was at. So I think humility plays a lot into that because neither side really wants to have any give and take. It Because it's like, well, so for me, as a Christian, what I would be inclined to do, what my nature is to do, is to just utterly reject any atheist and say, no, what, what I believe in is true, what you believe in is false, I'm not going to have any humility about this and I'm just going to completely ignore you. And that's exactly what the scientists will do, except they do the opposite. No, God does not exist. I'm right. You're dumb. So humility would play a very big part, and I think that would be key to start actual civil conversations about it instead of just kind of for the most part just ignoring the other side and kind of just brushing it away and just living in your own bubble that you create for yourself that's just what you believe and you just refuse to listen to others. Okay, thank you. <coughs> All right, my turn. So how long have you been at MCA? Uh, since second grade. Man, so that would be... That's a long uh, time. Ten years? Yeah. And here we are. Yeah. Did you think you'd be here? Uh, so, uh, I knew I would be here as a senior, but I didn't comprehend the fact that I was going to be sitting here. <laughs> oh, I mean, one of those. Maybe I won't last that long, but that scary senior oral. Okay, so I was your fifth grade teacher. Yes. I have to ask. Please don't, please don't blackmail me. No, I would never do that. Any, any favorite fifth grade memories? Because we have some of the... Uh, repeat offenders in here also from fifth grade. <laughs> yeah, I was one. You of knew those. I was going to ask that. I know you did. Yeah. Come on. What do you wait? <laughs> Any fifth grade memories? That, what do you remember about fifth grade? Oh no. You have to be nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was pretty chatty. Um, Chatting with Charles. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. We had our old TV show, Chatting uh, with Charles. Yeah, I, 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 I seem to recall that uh, after our grade kind of put you through the ringer, you kind of just uh, came up here. Came up here. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was my pleasure. It was, uh, it was a good grade to end. It was a good class to end on. It really was. So um, I also have Kyle in robotics. So words of wisdom for a robotics leader on his way out. What have you learned? Uh, okay. I have learned how to incorporate my teammates' wants and needs into the build process and into 
the way that I talk to them and the way that I speak and the way that I converse with them in the sense of sometimes, uh, and this, I've seen this happen with everyone, including myself, is when you get in that position of power, especially in robotics, it's easy, it's easy due to you having the experience to just brush aside uh, the younger kids and just say, this is my project. I'm going to try and put into this everything I can. And so that's the biggest lesson, especially that I learned this year. I started learning it last year because that was the first time I actually had like real power. And uh, <laughs> real power. We will not. We will not have Star Wars references. <laughs> so um, I have to ask why? Why this? Why this topic? Well. It's kind of been an overarching theme at MCA, I, f MCA, I feel like, uh, since probably about ninth grade when you start really getting into the deeper philosophy stuff in English. Uh, and especially the last two years, uh, junior year in English 4 was very helpful for me in the sense of uh, apologetic conversations, just because the material, not necessarily because of the material we were reading, but because of the discussions that we had. So uh, I had Mr. Westfall last year for English 4. That might be one of the most impactful classes that I've, I've had in terms of that, just because of the discussions we got into, not necessarily the <laughs> reading material. Mm -hmm. Well, neat. Yeah. And where are you going to be next year? TCU. Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, for anyone that doesn't know. Ooh. What TC is? Go purple. You're not, not losing your school colors. Go I frogs. Think. Yeah, I yeah. Don't, I don't so have to change convenient. my wardrobe. Very, very Black nice. and purple. So, um, do you anticipate running into any atheists at Texas Christian University? Probably yes. So they they are among us. Right? Yes. Um, so hypothetically, Kyle, what what are you going to major in? Uh, I am signed up for pre business right now, uh, so it will be something in business. Okay, so. Which, to me, this is a very practical thing mm -hmm. to do research on. Um, so let's, let's have a scenario. Kyle gets his first job, and he goes to this nice big office and this nice big, big firm, and he's the only Christian there, and everybody else is an atheist. What does that look like for you, and how would you handle that? Okay. Um, so firstly, what I would definitely try to incorporate into my everyday life would be to always come off as... A very positive person. Uh, I would try to embody the fruits of the Spirit in everything that I did. And so back to what I said earlier uh, to Mr. Reed, for me personally it's better to establish relationships and then have the conversation once it, once it will come off more as a friendly civil discussion rather than just a straight-up attack. Mm -hmm. So what I would do, as I said, uh, trying to embody uh, what Christ would want me to embody. And after I'd been there a while, I would, and built relationships, I would slowly try to infiltrate the ranks. <laughs> I, I knew you'd slip something like that in here. <laughs> so, um, I have you in astronomy as well. Mm -hmm. um, anything that we've done or read in astronomy that has helped you kind of formulate this thesis, um, yeah. anything that you've enjoyed that we've done in astronomy for that? You know, I, it, didn't, it didn't have anything to do with the thesis, but I particularly enjoyed uh, all the discussion about the planets. I think, I think the individual nature of each and every planet is very, is very interesting, and it, 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 it's enjoyable for me to read as a massive nerd. Uh, but for stuff that actually influenced my thesis, um, so I talk about how stars are formed and stuff. I found that really interesting just because it was the fact that they can describe it in detail. Mm -hmm. They can describe all these things in such acute detail, but then when you get to something like the Big Bang Theory, they're like, oh, well, this happened. Well, can you explain that to me? No, no, no this happened. <laughs> this happened, and that's that. So, and that was in the binder that we read mm -hmm. that we actually are still reading in astronomy. So as far as what's been helpful in that class, I think that would be helpful. It's just the realization that 
they can describe what they want to describe mm -hmm. and what they're able to, but then they conveniently leave out things that they find difficult to talk about. Mm -hmm. Goldilocks planet. I love that. I love that term. What if we find another Goldilocks planet? I believe, uh, I believe there are some that have already been discovered. Uh, they have very complicated designations like SR dash seven something something. Uh, but there's, there's, there's a few in out there that have been discovered through uh, teles various telescopes, okay. I believe. What does that mean for mankind, though? Do you think it affects our relationship with God if there's another Goldilocks planet out there? Oh, now we're getting into the complicated stuff. So I have one I job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think as far as that goes, it depends on whether you view God... It depends on whether you view humanity as something special that God wanted to be unique and to be the only uh, versions of himself out there. Or it could conversely be, you know, something that you think that maybe, maybe he created another version of humanity that are also in his image. We aren't exact copies. So, obviously, because we're fallen. And so there very well could be other versions of humanity or there could be other humans. So it's really, it's, it just depends on what you believe. Uh, I, I don't think, I don't necessarily subscribe to the alien thing. It's fun to, it's fun to talk about and read about, but uh, with the facts that are presented right now, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that changes anything about the current situation we're in. Okay, very good. Great job, Kyle. Thank you. I was sitting here listening to all the times that Mrs. Telshow has had you as a student and was, uh, being a little jealous and a little sorry for her, but then I realized I've had you about that much too over the years, so I had, didn't have you till seventh grade, um, and then I had you again in 10th and 11th and a lot in robotics in between. Um, one uh, personal question I want to ask you about that is uh, uh, the first version of Kyle I knew was the seventh grade version. Um, uh, w what's a key way that you see that you've grown and changed since in those last five years? Um, I've grown in my tolerance of other people. Okay. Uh, in seventh grade, I, if I didn't like someone, I would just I would just be like, "Yeah, I don't like you. I'm not going to hang out with you." And now it's like, yeah, I'll sit down and have a conversation with you and see what kind of person you are and um, at least give you a chance. Because like, I would just judge people by sight, which was sad. <laughs> uh, but uh, So in that way, I've improved. And I also just think overall, uh, I, I think just overall I'm a better person. But. It has been fun to watch you grow and change. And uh, it, it, you have... Uh, You've changed in a lot of great ways over those six, those six years, so it's been fun to know you. Um, so as you look at this data that you've kind of piled up, um, on a scale of z zero to 100, how obvious is it to you that there is a creator behind it? So I need to context that before I give you a number. Um, there, there was a lot more coincidences from the fine-tuning that I came across. Uh, a lot, more, definitely a whole lot more than than I put in just for the sake of time. I didn't want to just bore everyone by listing every single thing I came across. Good decision. Uh, and so from that, I can honestly say 99.9%. .9%, that 0.1% is just simply because you can never know, you can never completely know anything. Okay. So that's so where then the faith comes in. You look at Dawkins who looks at a lot of the same data that you did. Mm -hmm. How convinced do you think he is that there is a God on the scale of zero to 100? Well, I read an interview with him, and he said that he didn't completely rule it out. Uh, but I would say that when you're in that position, and this actually came up in my interview with Mr. Ray's, was just the fact that when you've subscribed yourself to a worldview, and you've put yourself so deeply into it like Dawkins has. So, for example, he's written quite a few books, uh, some 
that were refuting Christian books that were released. So when you've put yourself so deeply into that, it's very hard to reverse your stance, even if you are open to new ideas. So while I would say that he does think it's a possibility, I would say that probably at this point he's too stubborn to be coaxed on much. Okay. Can you assign a number value for what you think? I like numbers. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Um, I would say in his mind, he, you know, he's pretty intelligent. Um, I would probably put him at 40%. Okay. So um, do you think, uh, well, well, hold on. I guess I want, I want to uh, insert a quote. You, you uh, use Pascal's wager. Um, mm-hmm. Here's, Here's the book that that came out of. I haven't read it, but I've, I've heard enough about it to kind of get the gist of it. Okay. He was a theologian. He was also a mathematician. You left that part out, and so I wanted to go ahead and give a shout-out to him for that. <laughs> um, but here's, here's what the quote says, um, and I want, you, I want to hear your comments on it. He says, okay. There's enough light for those who desire only to see, and enough darkness for those of a contrary disposition. There's enough light for those to see, but also darkness. There's enough light for those who desire only to see, and enough darkness for those of a contrary disposition. Okay. So, why do you think, God, I mean, you and Dawkins are kind of looking at the same data and really drawing opposite conclusions. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably generous. Uh, he, he's probably not as close to 40%, close to the middle as as, as, as you're offering. Okay. Um, but why... Why do you think God has set it up in such a way that two two people can look at the exact same information and draw completely opposite conclusions? Do you think that's cruel? Do you think it's cruel that that can happen? That they can that God set things up that way? Oh, um, or do you think God set things up that way, or is it is it a problem with us instead? Well, I think a lot of it is just due to the fact that the way that Christians can grow is through trials. And I would call it a trial that a lot of the world kind of comes after Christians in a sense. Okay. Uh, maybe not physically like other religions where people are actually abused for what they believe, but verbally can wear you down over time too if, it's, if there's enough of it. So I would consider that a trial. So in a sense, I think a lot of atheists, especially like Dawkins and just prevalent people like him, are part of God's plan as a trial, just to test which Christians are actually steadfast in their faith in Him and which ones are not necessarily strong enough and need to grow. Do you think it's important that, uh, I guess like the Pascal quote says, for God to give us enough of a 50-50 where it's not clear to where we actually have a choice to make? Because if it really is 99% clear or 99.9% clear, I guess I'm worried that that we're not actually making a choice in that. Well, uh, humans do have inherent free will. Uh, We can see that from the Bible. And so I would say that for Christians, that's why it's so easy to see is just combined with other things. Like, for example... uh, You know, I kind of lost the question. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. So I guess I want to try to maybe repackage it. But, you know, you, uh, in your conversation with Mr. Rays, you said that, uh, that Dawkins could get so entrenched into his worldview that he might yeah. not be able to find his way out of it because everything kind of looks the same. Yes. Um, do you think this, we can be susceptible to the same thing on our side? Oh, absolutely. That's part of the trial is whether your faith is strong enough or not to survive it. That's absolutely a big part of it. Okay. Uh, one last connected question, but, um, you know, you, you talk about with Darwinian evolution there, you know, one of the holes that it's hard to know what to do with is the Cambrian explosion. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the holes for the big bang theory is, uh, like where it actually all originated from. Have you, in, in the course of your investigation, um, of your own faith, have you encountered any of those holes yourself in, in what you hold to be true? In Christianity, okay. Um, something that used to shake me a lot would be to go through the Old Testament and read about 
the old laws uh, with the executions and st the stuff like that. And then to go to the New Testament and read about Jesus and the way more accepting messages that were being uh, conveyed in the New Testament. And that bothered me for a long time. Uh, but what kind of what kind of refuted that for me was uh, over time I came to realize that people were kind of less civilized at the time that the Old Testament was being written. And so when people are less civilized, less civil laws are required to maintain order. Uh, we can see this in any society that was thriving at the time that the Old Testament was written. And we can compare that society. So for example, Rome was pretty cr cruel in terms of punishments to non-citizens. So when you contrast Rome, which was the major superpower of its time, and actually Rome was during the New Testament, but it still serves my point. When you contrast Rome with America, which is, I would say is this one of the superpowers of today, you can see this same concept of the stricter laws because it was stricter times, it was less civil times, versus now, I think humans as a whole have progressed a little bit, and so there's not really harsher pun as harsh punishments required to get the point across that you don't need to, uh, you need to be a moral person and not do things that are harmful to your fellow man. Okay, thank you. All right, so <clears throat> I'll ask you uh, one more question. Uh, so we've kind of heard about, uh, which I, I really didn't get to really get to know you until last year uh, when I had you in class. And so uh, I've been able to hear and learn about your progression since fifth grade. Um, so looking back at your time here at MCA, the many, many, many years, um, is there anything that you wish now that you're a senior, you're about to graduate and you have some younger in the audience, uh, is there anything you wish if you could kind of do it again, uh, turn back time, uh, is there anything you wish you would do different or, or take more advantage of? Man. Um, and that is tough to think about on the spot. Um, Probably, probably something I would do differently would just be to spend more time in the student center, I feel like. Because I was kind of a hermit in the resource center for uh, about seventh to probably like the middle of ninth grade. So I didn't really develop many of the friendships I have now from hanging out in the student center until kind of the beginning of my sophomore year. And that's progressed and most of them have gotten stronger since then. So if I had to if I had to do one thing over, it would be to it would be to sacrifice homework doing time to socializing time. Just finding more of that balance. Yes. Cuz I was on the I was strictly on the academic balance <laughs> side and it was it was fun. You could pretty much come in here any day and just see me, you know, hunched over nose almost touching the paper writing something down you know so. I get one more my goodness well I, I'm a I'm a dirt person I'm an archaeologist right so mm -hmm. I have to ask you um, do do evolutionists accept or reject the Cambrian explosion they accept that it happened, but they don't say that it is evidence for the existence of God. Because what they say is they uh, actually have an article for it right here. And they name a species called, I'm probably going to butcher this, Ediacarans. They name the species Ediacaran, and they say that it may have been an ancestor of currently existing animals, but then they don't give any proof of what they're saying. So this is a, this is a very soft may that they're using. When earlier in the article, they use a very hard no 
in response to God being or having any responsibility in the creation of the world. So from this contrast, you can see that they make this very, very bold statement, and then they don't really have anything to back it up. So while they do accept that it happened or that the evidence points to it, they really don't you still can't really fully talk about accept it. it. So many. Okay, I, this is my last question, really. Um, the idea, and I think in popular culture, that we Christians kind of get a bad rap because there's a lot of people out there, and I, I know you watch TV and stuff like that, and there are TV shows that really kind of portray Christians as sort of ignorant because they believe in God. Mm-hmm. What is our Christian response to that? Well, first I'd like to say that I think Christians have done it to themselves as far as that. For, uh, there's, a good, there's a good amount of responsibility that is laid on Christians for that, in my opinion, just because uh, we, and I'm, and I'm not dis- disincluding myself from this, I'm including myself in this, we have a tendency to say, well, I'm a Christian, you're not, I'm, that makes me better than you, or that makes me have an advantage over you. Uh, so... While I would say we do have some of the responsibility, what I would say to what you actually asked is that it really... I I obviously have a negative response to it. I I don't view it positively. So I think our response to it should be to be more accepting to be more willing to sit down and have a civil conversation. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, with an atheist, sit down and talk about their own science in their own terms to where they can understand instead of just, you know, in a passive, in a passing moment saying, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You're going to, you're going to go to, you know, where you're not going to. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, good. Very well done. All right. Well, although this conversation could go for a while longer, it's we get to pass it back to you, and you can ask us a question. Okay. So my fr- I'll go around counterclockwise, since you already have the microphone. Or counterclockwise, yes. All right. You just tell us who you who you're asking. <laughs> okay. So I'm asking you, um, if you had, if you had the opportunity, opportunity to ask God one direct question and receive a direct, in-depth answer, what would it be? (laughs) Do you want a different question? (laughs) I'm an Enneagram 9 for any Enneagram folks in the room, and we have trouble prioritizing like so you know I have 15 questions that come to mind right now and I'm like well would I ask that one or would I ask that one so I guess I'll just go um, with um, one of the uh, one of the first things that comes to mind I think uh, early early in my adulthood, I um, I guess I, I had I had kind of a pretty airtight belief system of okay th- this is this is why God has set things up to um, uh, to to reveal Himself to a very small group of people in human history and do His work through through His chosen people mm-hmm. and. Uh, and I, I kind of had my easy answers for, okay, this is why those other people got left out. And as I, as I've aged, um, and read more, I've had, I've had a lot of trouble with that idea, just trying to reconcile like, God, why, why have you chosen s- such a small group? What is it that you're really up to, um, in, in the, in the large scale of humanity? And so, I think it would be something like that. I think I probably know the answer that he would give me. Um, and uh, it's that he, 
I guess kind of like what Christ did with the disciples, um, that, that instead of coming up with a million friends on Twitter, um, to keep up with the work of Jesus, you know, in, in, uh, in the Middle East, he said, I'm going to start with a small group and I can accomplish a lot through a very small group of faithful people. And so that gives me hope just for like, you know, I, I think about the number of people who have graduated from Midland Class School. I think we're up to like 400. Wow. That's like almost as big as one graduating class from one of the other high schools in town <laughs> in a single year. <laughs> and so you just go, God, is it, do, is it really making a difference? Because we're talking about a pretty small group of people, but then you realize like, I don't know, in God's economy and in the scale where he works, he, he can accomplish a lot of great things through, um, uh, through seemingly inefficient means. Mm -hmm. Okay. I hope mine's easier. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, how has robotics shaped you positively as a person? I love robotics. Um, I never thought that I would say that the bus barn is my happy place, <laughs> but it really is. Mine too. Yeah, and I love the culture that we have, and I love the, the opportunity to spend time with with the students and get to know them better. Um, I would say that it's impacted me incredibly positively because... It, it's become, it's really become my happy place, and it's where I can go and relax and, and have a few laughs and solve some problems at the same time, and I'm very thankful for robotics. Okay. All right. I saved the hardest question. Oh, no, good. <laughs> so let's assume for a minute um, that the, un- the universe actually does have finite resources, and put yourself in the shoes of Thanos. Oh no. I want you to tell me how would how you would go about saving the universe in a in a more in a better way that would not allow not justify the Avengers coming after you. So no snapping allowed, huh? No snapping. Spoiler alert. Um, gosh. <laughs> um, I wish I knew as much science as those sitting next to me right now. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, uh, as a believer, the one thing that would give me some somewhat of rest in the back of my mind, uh, though it'd be pressing if I was in charge of the world and trying to figure that out, uh, is knowing that God already knew this was going to happen. God already has a plan. Uh, so that would at least help. Um, the more immediate, uh, especially since I have a family and friends and uh, I care about people's lives, I guess, uh, man, I'd probably invest a whole lot in... Uh, Trump's uh, space force, and uh, <laughs> probably probably try to find one of those Goldilocks planets that that have been discussed, and and hope it's it's uh, worth uh, digging into. Because yeah, that's that's one of those scary things. You have a lot of people talking about, and who knows what the future holds. But I hope I'm not in charge when that happens. <laughs> okay, cool. quick prayer. Heavenly God, we thank you today. We thank you for Kyle. We thank you for his brain. We thank you for his talents. We thank you for his weaknesses. We thank you for these people who are here with us, that we may fellowship with him and send him off to TCU knowing that he is, he's God's child and he's going to bring good to this world. In your name, amen. Amen.